I'd like to welcome everybody to the February 26th meeting of the Newburn Board of Aldermen. At this time, would you join me in a prayer? Heavenly Father, we just ask that as we do the people's work that you would be pleased with what we do as we do our work tonight in the best interest of the city that we all love. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you join me in the pledge of allegiance to the flag of our country? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, would you call the roll? Alderman Bingle here. Alderwoman Harris. Present. Alderman Astor. Here. Mayor Outlaw. Here. Alderman Kinsey. Here. Alderman Best. Alderman Odom. Okay. Now, is the agenda any changes before we get going here? Yes, sir. Mayor, I'd like to make a uh, motion to accept the consent agenda as is. Okay. Second. We have a motion and a second. Did you get the second, Madam Clerk? I did. Any discussion? All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 All opposed, the same. At this time, we'll go to item number five, Mr. Stevens. Thank you, Mayor, members of the board. Uh, tonight, uh, we will have a presentation of our comprehensive annual financial report um, and uh, auditor's discussion and analysis uh, has been previously distributed to the board for your review. Uh, there's a representative here with us tonight from Malden and Jenkins. It's the firm that has been performing the city's audit. Uh, and they will discuss uh, the findings of the CAFR and the audit and answer any kind of questions that the board may have. Um, if uh, you have any questions, uh, JR, myself, or uh, our consultant will be glad to answer those for you. Yes, you have a question, Alderman McKenzie? I have a question for the consultant. On page 17 and 18, could you explain those five items there? And what do you think? about those five items, what we need to do about them. Good evening, Mayor and members of the board. Um, I'm, I'm assuming you're referring to page 18 in our auditor's discussion and analysis. That is correct, the okay. five items there that uh, you found on 17 and 18. Yes, sir. Uh, well, so I can address those. I am going to go through this document, so okay. I can go ahead and address your question, but those are just uh, we call those kind of byproducts of the audit. They're recommendations for management just through the audit process. Um, obviously, we're going to find things that we have to cite under the standards as findings. And then inevitably, we will potentially run across areas where we see room for improvement. But they don't meet the standards of being reported as a finding or a deficiency. These are just those byproducts. They're the recommendations that we've made to management. And as governance, we just provide them as evidence to you all of what we've communicated to them of areas where there could be improvements in the processes. Um, they've, we've met with management, we've discussed all these items, um, but they're not items that we view as being significant or deficiencies in the control, in the control structures of the city's uh, finances, but they're byproducts of the audit where we see room for improvement. Thank you. <coughs> yes, sir. Um, so with that, um, my name is James Bentz. I'm one of the partners with Malden and Jenkins. And I'm here tonight to present to you all your comprehensive annual financial report, which is the larger of the two documents, and then our auditor's discussion and analysis, which is what we put together just to summarize the audit. I'm not going to read it. You do have it. If at any point in time you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, and we're also available any other, uh, throughout the year. Uh, but just to hit a few highlights in here, um, just to make sure uh, to communicate some of these items. We are independent auditors in the, in the city's audit process. The preparation of the financial statements and the information included in your document is the responsibility of the city's management. And as the external auditors, it's our responsibility to audit that information. Uh, we audited your financial statements in accordance with government auditing standards and generally accepted auditing standards, uh, which means that we test sufficient information to be able to issue a, a, an opinion as to whether or not the statements are materially correct. We don't test 100 percent. The standards don't require that, but we have to test enough to say that they're materially correct. And so we did that. We tested um, all of your activity and all of your funds, uh, and we were able to issue an unmodified opinion, which is a clean opinion, which states that the financial statements as prepared by management are materially correct. So that's the opinion you've received in the past and you continue to receive for June 30, 2018. Um, on page five of that document, I do want to take a couple of minutes and just kind of com commend the city as a whole, as well as management. Um, you guys prepare the comprehensive annual financial statements, um, the comprehensive annual financial report, uh, the, the minimum required basic set of financial statements, 
doesn't include as much information. And what you guys do takes a lot of time on management, and it provides a lot of good information to the end users. Um, it includes an introductory section, which gives a letter of transmittal, which provides information overall to the city, uh, information about where it's been and where it's going, as well as giving statistical information in the back, which provides a 10-year trend of where the city's been, so that readers can kind of get a gauge of how the city's performing. Um, you're one of only 147 counties and municipalities in the state that does that currently. Um, obviously, that's, that's a minority, it's something to be proud of, and again, it does take a lot of time and effort to do that. So I do want to commend the city for doing that, um, and you received the Certificate in excellent for Excellence for Financial Reporting for last year, and the document's been submitted for this year's approval process. It typically takes about seven months to get that back, so we should hear something this summer. Um, on page eight of our document, um, to point out a few results from the general fund, which is obviously your main operating fund. That's where most of your um, non-utility activity happens. Uh, you ended the year, you can see at the bottom of page eight, you've got a four-year trend of where your fund balance ended. Uh, you ended 2018's fiscal year with a total fund balance that represented about 54% of your annual operating expenditures. And the unassigned portion, which is what you have available to you going forward, represents about 38%. That is about four and a half months for the city's operating um, budget. And GFOA, which is the national organization who reviews CAPRs for financial reporting excellence, um, they recommend governments have about two months in there. So when you try to evaluate where am I in the health range of my general fund, uh, you can see they're, sh they're looking for people to try to maintain 16 to 20% and you're at about 38. So you guys are doing pretty good. Um, in your capper, if you want to flip with me, um, when you try to look at your utility funds, your, your enterprise funds, they're a little bit different because fund balance doesn't represent the same thing that it does in the general fund. So we typically look at your cash flows. And so you've got three main uh, enterprise funds being your electric, your water, and your sewer. And for the year into June 30, 2018, all three of them reported positive cash flows from operations, uh, which is a good performance of how those three funds are operating. But what that doesn't show is what are you doing with the cash. And so you can see in the middle of the page, uh, we've got cash flows related to our capital financing, which is typically how you're reinvesting those funds into your system, whether it be through capital outlays, payments of debt service, uh, which generally the debt service was for a capital outlay project. So again, reinvesting in the system itself. And so the electric fund reported $10 million of cash flows, but you can see they reinvested about $5.5 million into the system, which is a strong taking those cash flows that you've generated through the system and, and expanding or improving the system in, in and of itself. Um, and with water and sewer, both of them uh, had positive cash flows of around three and a half million and both had approximately $5 million of reinvestments into the system. Um, on page 13, as part of the audit process, we also issued two compliance reports. One was a yellow book report or a government auditing standards report, which is where we reported on the internal controls uh, related to the city. And we did not report any material weaknesses this year, um, which is a, is a positive note. Um, we also issued a compliance report related to the state single audit. We tested the activity of the Powellville funds this year, and we issued a clean opinion on those, stating that the activity of the Powellville for 2018 uh, was compliant with the state's single audit act. And the last thing that I'll touch on is, again, I you know emphasize the independence of the external audit. Um, we, we audit the information provided by management, and I, I know everyone in the room is aware of what happened to the city this year, but I want to commend the city. We were able to get the reports out in December this year, which given Florence coming through and the effect that that had on the city is pretty impressive for city to, the city to be able to still get the reports out and still focus on getting those audits done. Um, we expected to have a big interruption in the audit process, but I, I want to commend JR and, and Lori and their team on getting us the information, allowing us to get these audits done and wrapped up. So um, that's something I'm impressed and proud to be a part of. So um, with that, uh, if you all have any other questions, I'd be happy to address them. I um, did have a question back. You, you mentioned the fund balance was somewhere in the 50% and the un, um, unsigned fund balance was like 38%. How were you able to go in there and determine that? Is that based on, did you look at 
things that we are, um, uh, the board has made a approvals on to that will affect the fund balance itself. How, did, how is that, what's the dif differential on that? The biggest differential in those two percentages is the state stabilization requirements, which uh, state law requires you to have a calculated percentage of your fund balance that you're not allowed to appropriate each year. It's kind of a, a safety net so that govern governments can't overextend and, and consume all of their resources. And it's a moving number. It's based on your unrestricted assets in the fund compared to your liabilities at the end of the year. But it's set so that you'll have a certain percentage of your fund balance that's available that you're not allowed as a board to commit and, and expend in the coming so, year. So, I mean, industry-wide, if we can say that, is that, is, are we within the norm or was that a little bit unusually, dif the differential was greater? That's very norm for norm. North Carolina um, because every government has the state stabilization requirement. And so you're going to have from your total number a percentage that you're not allowed and it's considered restricted. It's in your fund balance, but it's not available to you going forward. And do you, do you as part of your, oh, it might not be within your scope, in reviewing the city of Newburn, are there any, um, any additional checks and balances that you think that we need to incorporate in our system? Do you, did you see anything that we need to do that other cities are doing for accountab accountability purposes or anything? I guess I would say no. I mean, the only kind of byproduct recommendations are the five items we cited in here. Um, overall, we didn't have anything that we identified as being material weaknesses in the system. And kind of, you know, I know you guys are going through a big upgrade, and that, that potentially may have some points next year where we see areas for improvement in the year of implementation. But as of right now, we don't have anything additional to report that's not already in the document. And if you saw any pending litigations that really were um, were extremely uh, atypical or anomalies of, of, of typical cities. Would that be pointed out any different, or do you do you get into that? Um, every city has those, so we do. It, it, the standards require us to communicate with your attorneys. So any any firms that you use that are providing litigation defense, uh, we get input from them as far as what cases are ongoing, and then we evaluate with them and with management as to how those cases would affect the financial reporting of the city. Um, there's disclosures in your footnotes related to pending litigation cases, and if they, if they qualify as being uh, reasonably possible then, and they have a measurable outcome, then they end up being accrued in your financials. Um, I, think, and, I think the only cases <coughs> that we had this year related to workers' comp items, which were already included in your mm -hmm. accruals to begin with, so we didn't have additional accruals on top of your existing claims payable liabilities. And then do you, I know some cities have extremely high unfunded employee benefits um, and, and some cities I'm talking like 50 million or so, I know ours continues to grow. Is, is that a part of the scope of your audit? And of course that I would assume is within relevant range of, of typical cities our size. It is, so the, it, I mean, all of the governments, especially now this year, um, this, there was new standards related to the reporting of your post-employment health care plans, and it changed the reporting across, across the country of how governments recognize those benefits and the liabilities associated with them. Um, we've evaluated those. The liabilities are calculated by actuaries, and, and we evaluate their assumptions that they put into it, and we make sure the assumptions they use for your plan are consistent with those for other plans. Um, most of your pension, you're in state-funded plans, so you're on the same you have a prorated share of the plan, which is the same plan that other governments are in. So your actuary calculations, your assumptions, all the inputs to the pension plans are typically very consistent because everyone's in the same plan. Um, but the actuary but you, could actually, it could, it could change depending on a, a municipality as far as their workforce, is that right? Would that, is that so across it, the board? Your, your share changes every year based on the amount you contribute the prior year. Okay. So what you report this year is allocated to you based on how much you contributed to the local government employer's plan last year in okay. 2017 fiscal year. Uh, Alderman Kinsey, do you have a question? Out of those five uh, findings, um, would we have to do a budget amendment for two of the items down the road of the findings? Out of the management recommendations? Um, Out of the five, the uh, 
the Kell Road and the retirement, would we have to come back and do a budget amendment for any of those two there? So this they are already taken care of. Yeah, the, these are items that are already, this would just change the allocation within okay. I'm just asking the reporting. Sure. No. Um, what was your other one? Uh, it's just those two there, the, the uh, retirement and the Kale Road. The retirement, neither would have a budget impact on them. Uh, the retirement is you're moving the revenues and expenditures from a self-insurance plan to the, the general fund. Um, based on the implementation of the new standards, retirees are no longer active employees and shouldn't be in the internal service fund. So there's no budget because the general fund was already putting the money there. Okay. More have other questions? No, I appreciate that. I appreciate y'all and I really appreciate the hard work of the staff and for where we are with uh, Mr. Stevens. Are we about 13, 14 million dollars into this storm? Yeah, it's probably going to be 14 or so. Probably. Yeah, I just uh, appreciate where we are and, and everybody with the city that's doing what they're doing. Uh, does the board have questions? Are you ready? Uh, I just want to thank you for giving the reports out early to us. Appreciate it. Yeah, we, we really appreciate that. You know, for years we just uh, we didn't have the information prior to, and I know the board really appreciate the opportunity to take a look at the information to ask questions like Paul McKenzie's been asking. Do we have to do anything? Do we have to adopt it or do you want, do we need a, any action on this at this time? No, no sir. Okay. We thank, thank you, all. sir, for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stevens, number six. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, item number six is uh, kind of an update on the resiliency plan. I uh, wanted to make it kind of a formalized item on our agenda uh, to discuss rather than bringing up under my management comments, just uh, in case the board had any questions or if any folks from the public uh, saw it as the agenda that they wanted to. Uh, um, uh, attend and listen to, but uh, ultimately um, there's there's three main things I think that we kind of have going on right now uh, with regards to resiliency planning. Uh, obviously the storm uh, greatly impacted us uh, back in September and, and uh, uh, we've been in a lot of the recovery phase for many months now and, and ultimately uh, in transitioning to the resiliency phase uh, our goal is to uh, minimize the impact of events and storms and, and any kind of uh, disastrous type events that could uh, uh, economically challenge, uh, socio-economically challenge our city uh, uh, moving forward in the future. Um, there are several things that we've discussed. Many of y'all attended a, uh, um, I guess, a presentation from the uh, folks from UNC Asheville and the NEMAC. Uh, Fernleaf Group, I think they call them, call them themselves the Collider Group or whatever, but ultimately the mayor and I um, uh, were able to meet those folks at the Metro Mayor's Conference in Asheville back in the fall um, and um, I have had some, some telephone discussions and email discussions with them regarding the work that they did for um, the city of Asheville, they've done some work for the city of Charleston, South Carolina, they've done some work uh, down in Florida, they're currently doing some work for uh, the Triangle area uh, around Raleigh uh, with regards to residency planning and that residency plan oftentimes focuses on trying to minimize the negative <coughs> dip that you see um, for communities uh, by shallowing that dip when it looks at the economic impacts and socioeconomic impacts and, and things like that for community. It could go as far as uh, jobs lost or businesses impacted, uh, um, so forth and so on, and what, what kind of impacts that has on a community and then ultimately makes recommendations as to what you can do uh, to try to mitigate those impacts in the future. Um, as you all, all heard, whenever they performed those presentations, um, you know, they produced some recommend, recommendations out of that study and it's ultimately the, the uh, responsibility of the board or the city or, or whomever it is at that point to, to implement many of those strategies and it could be anywhere from stormwater to uh, internal uh, strategies of, of how we do things to building codes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, so that's one of the things that we're currently working on. Um, obviously, uh, with, a, with a project as a, as a large scale as a residency plan, you're probably going to have to do an RFQ process for that and obviously I would need some direction from the board uh, to budget that or to put it into the upcoming fiscal year budget um, if we so choose to do that, but ultimately we would need to get uh, requests for qualifications from uh, professional consultants to, to uh, 
uh, perform those services for us and then ultimately um, it, it, it is a, a you know a long-term process to where they evaluate data evaluate the impacts uh, uh, do surveys uh, within your community on jobs and, and businesses and and everything else so it's, it's pretty important um, we've also had a, a discussion with uh, UNC Wilmington and UNC Wilmington has been doing some regional um, kind of southeast regional eastern North Carolina regional work uh, with regards to uh, socioeconomic impacts of the hurricane and that that looks at um, uh, some of your more distressed areas of your city and how negative uh, the impacts of storms are specifically if I you know in, in our area Craven County was identified as high high in their matrix of uh, socioeconomically challenged or impacted communities uh, based on the studies that they saw obviously we had a significant amount of storm drain it or storm uh, surge and flooding and much of that was in our low to moderate income communities and therefore uh, it was really no surprise to me that that was the uh, the findings uh, but ultimately they are doing a lot of work and we came through with some more recommendations for them to possibly do some more deeper dive studies uh, into the New Bern area and they were going to go back and research that with a couple of their colleagues within the uh, department so we're kind of early on in that they've been working with Alice with the GIS program and and uh, a lot of the data that we have collected through the dashboard uh, when we did our, our damage assessments and, and things like that. So, so um, expect a lot to come out of that uh, to help us out with data and planning and, and future ways in which we can mitigate uh, the impacts of, of storms here in New Bern. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm a little, I've got a little throat issue going on. Uh, uh, but uh, um, we finally, the third thing that we've done is, is um, we've been having some discussions with a, a community group here uh, with regards to uh, potentially uh, having an employee and as you recommend, as, as the board directed me to do so, uh, to look at an employee uh, that was kind of the flood czar, I think was the, 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 the quote that was, was used at the time. Uh, we've been having a very, uh, uh, a lot of, I've been having a lot of phone calls, a lot of discussions with folks, and, and that, that person has been very difficult to find. Um, and since then, we have had some discussions with this community group that's very engaged in this resiliency planning and the efforts in moving forward so that we can try to help uh, prevent the impacts of, of storm events to our community. And it, it really has morphed more into, instead of a Q&A kind of person, to more of a, a planner or a, a higher level uh, study person that has uh, some background in, in resiliency planning and, and flood mitigations and things like that. Uh, so um, uh, with that effort, um, uh, you know, that's, that's obviously a decision of the board. Uh, we were allocated $50,000 uh, uh, between now and June the 30th is what the board gave me direction on. Um, and once again, like I said, it's been very difficult to find someone that just wants to come in and work for three or four months. Um, uh, if it was more of a long-term thing or whatever, I've, I've spoken to a gentleman that was at uh, UNC School of Government who has since moved to North Carolina State University, big research guy. Uh, I've talked to a couple consulting firms, uh, things like that, and it's just I, I'm not having a look. I think, Alderman Astor, you've reached out to some of your colleagues with, uh, with FEMA and at the state agencies and, and have, have, have had similar luck as I uh, in, in our inability to find that, that guru, if you want to call them that. So um, looking at more of a long-term plan, if we want to look at a residency plan, it may be something that we want to discuss. Obviously, a couple of y'all have participated in that as well, but I want to kind of update the community as to, uh, you know, we're, we're just not completely focused on the recovery. We're focused on what can we do in the future uh, to, to help minimize the impacts of storms uh, and, and events like uh, Hurricane Florence uh, in, in September to our community. And uh, so that's kind of my update as to where we are. I'm happy to answer any kind of questions the board has um, uh, regarding any of those matters. Uh, or if y'all have some direction for me, I'm happy to carry that or, or carry that into the budget season. Well, do we want to um, update a little bit? We just had a meeting this evening um, with, with this group. The mayor and I attended it. Um, this group's been very engaged and very active in assisting us and trying to um, work with us so that we can find the best means possible to um, find a resiliency plan or to, to really help our community. So in ensuing years, we have storms, we can mitigate the damages in a better manner. So um, right now, um, 
I guess you would call her an expert, was the former mayor of Hoboken, New Jersey. Of course, they had Superstorm Sandy and were inundated with water surge, pretty much like us. And um, they've invited her to come down here and do a potential public forum and then address the Board of Aldermen with a presentation. Uh, and uh, she's willing to do this, to come and speak to us for just expenses and no consulting fee, but we're estimating it to be $1,000 or less. And uh, Mark has money in his uh, community development budget. We wouldn't have to appropriate any money or anything, but we would have to direct him and just say, please move forward on that. So it would cover getting her down here, maybe a hotel night stay, something like that. So it would just be expenses. But she could come and potentially, this could be the springboard to hiring this resiliency person, maybe doing the plan. She could give us the pros and cons and really, um, you know, help us. So just want to open it up. If you think so, I, I think it's a good idea. And uh, I think that the city manager, is that correct, Mr. Manager? You'd just like some direction from us. Sure. We, no, no vote or anything like that, just how, direction. How soon can we get her here? Uh, I believe in March. She's been in touch with uh, Nelson McDaniel, and it's a group called CARES, and with Ms. Cho's out there, she's part of that group, and several other residents from throughout our community, John Baldwin Gibson's involved with that. It's a diverse group of people who are concerned about future flooding events, and uh, she's looking to come in March, so she'd be here sometime in March. We just don't know exactly what the date is. They're working with her. So if that's so, let's go ahead and move forward on that then. Do you want to mention about having a special meeting? or? Yeah, we like may. Uh, again, we're uh, Nelson has, is reaching out um, through someone else on the committee uh, to her to find our schedule. And we've yeah. asked her to come back so we potentially have a special call meeting so she could do her presentation. So she would come one night and do a community forum where we'd go to someplace like the History Center or Oranger and it would be open to all the community for people to come out, ask questions, do things, and then she'd like to come and make a formal presentation to the Board of Aldermen, but we would have to call for a special meeting because we feel like we should do it outside of the confounds of our regular meeting in case, you know, we want to give her as much time as she needs <coughs> to do the presentation. So if everybody's okay with that. You want to that form of motion or do you want to... Uh, no, I think it needs a motion, Mr. Okay. We don't need a motion, just direction. I direction guess. Does it, is everybody in favor of doing this? Mom, do you have any question? you think that's, that's a good thing? I think it really would be a good thing for us. Less today. than 50,000. Yeah, yeah isn't that the truth? <laughs> okay. Are you good? You yes, good with sir. that? Mr. Astor. I absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. okay. Well, is that good? Waters. Unless you have any other you might you might want to in one part I think that they they mentioned a little bit today is uh, and, and I think the mayor of Hoboken who mentioned uh, we've already working on the, the the regional alliance and the mutual aid I know you ran into quite a few situations this last hurricane where the mutual aid really helped out particularly Greenville and uh, if you, if you want me to detail, yeah. um, the mayor and I um, attended the, uh, actually, uh, um, Alderman Harris, uh, you, you came to the uh, dinner, but prior to the dinner, at the, it's called the State and Town Dinner. Uh, it's an opportunity where uh, your local elected officials are able to attend uh, a, a dinner in Raleigh uh, where there were probably 125 to 150 uh, state legislators uh, who, who were there. Um, an opportunity for us to, to sit down at the table. Norm Sanderson sat at our table. I appreciate his, uh, his uh, willingness to be there and sit with us as well as uh, Michael Speciali. Uh, both of them were, were sitting at the table with us and we had an opportunity to uh, uh, talk about local issues and obviously there are our local representatives. But prior to that, the mayor and I went up early in the morning and um, um, I, I had been working with uh, Tony McEwen with the City of Wilmington. He is their legislative uh, affairs uh, guy that uh, specializes in things going on in Raleigh um, and and uh, uh, the, we worked on a, an opportunity where we could have and pull together an alliance and we've we've named this the Eastern North Carolina um, Disaster Recovery and Resiliency Alliance and uh, um, we were we had the opportunity to meet with with multiple uh, state legislators uh, folks who are our, our budget and appropriations chair uh, we were able to meet with uh, uh, Mayor. You, you may know him. Uh, I think well, uh, we met with Senator Brown. Senator Brown, Representative Jackson, Chairman Brown, uh, 
Yep. And uh, of course, we, we had a meeting with the governor's uh, assistant and also Mike Sprayberry. Yeah, Mike Sprayberry, he's the director of uh, the emergency management for North Carolina. So, so it was a, a very beneficial trip for us. We were able to uh, uh, regionally look at, and it's kind of more the southeastern, I guess, region. Uh, since then, I've spoken with uh, uh, the city manager uh, with Greenville. I spoke with uh, Chuck Allen, the mayor in Goldsboro, and they're very interested in being a participants in this group. But uh, we had uh, Kinston and, and Wallace and us and Wilmington and Pender County. And I mean, there's just a, a tremendous amount of folks who attended that meeting with us and stood up there and, and had quite a few of our uh, representatives down here in the southeast who stood with us uh, at a press conference and announced this alliance as well as what our initiatives of that alliance are going to be. Um, and there's, there's five main initiatives that cover everything from transportation to uh, affordable housing, uh, looking for additional strategies that the state can, can ha uh, implement uh, for us to be able to, to focus on affordable housing here in eastern North Carolina. Uh, affordable housing is a, a tough issue nationwide, but it's even exacerbated further whenever you have storm events that take out a significant portion of your affordable housing. Um, uh, it, it also talks about our, our uh, creeks and streams and, and, and getting them uh, cleaned and mucked out. Um, it, and um, Mayor, what was the other one? I, I'm trying to recall. Education was the other one. Uh, I think some of our education systems uh, and the impacts of them. But quite a few things that we have on that list of, of, of initiatives. But uh, ultimately, it was very beneficial for us to just get a, a voice up there. And I think that's going to continue to grow and continue to build and be a loud voice uh, towards our representatives. So. Yeah. May I just want to make one co correction just so we don't want to offend the mayor coming from New Jersey. It's Hoboken in New Hoboken. Jersey and Hoboken in North Carolina, so I want to make sure. Okay. We, well, I appreciate you. We don't want to offend her. <laughs> okay. Okay, anything else on the resiliency any questions or anything? Uh, the one thing I, I would mention that I've been hearing in a lot of these trips to Raleigh, and, and it's, it's very important. The, the urban rural divide and uh, the rural areas of our state, particularly the coastal areas, feel kind of left out of this and we're trying to involve the, the managers as many within these counties that want to be involved. Do you want to mention, talk about that just a second? Sure. Because um, particularly Pender County had uh, $12 million in air quality issues within their school. I mean, for a small county like yeah. Under $12 million. Yeah, 12 $13 million in, in just air quality mold removal uh, from their schools. Um, and I mean, that, that, that'll, that'll drain a fund balance in a hurry. Uh, and so significant issues uh, for them. But that is a, a prime example of why the state legislators are looking at uh, the urban-rural divide where uh, the, the rural communities are struggling with uh, increased costs and, and not having, you know, uh, uh, adequate service levels or whatever it may be and that a lot of that um, is, and, and what you're seeing are is trends of the urban areas growing and the rural areas declining in population growth and obviously that exacerbates an issue. So what they're looking to do is try to pull together these regional approaches and uh, that was one of the uh, feathers in our cap, I guess, when we went to Raleigh to discuss these facts is the matter that we had, uh, you know, we had the rural folks there with us and the urban folks such as us in Kinston and, and Wilmington. And, um, and, and I think, the, the, like I said, the senators and, and our, our representatives really appreciated that fact. Um, and, and that's something that they're going to look at is these, these teamwork approaches and regional approaches of, of coming together, uh, looking at um, uh, ways to solve uh, significant reg regional issues through collaboration together. So. Of course, one other, one other thing, the, the lady, the attorney from Pender County, the county commissioner, she was talking about that one of their schools, when they recently uh, built a school, they had, uh, they were going to put a generator in it. And of course, just because of uh, cost savings, they did not do a generator. But I think that once we get a little bit further along in our alliance, we're going to be reaching out to the county school systems and, and at, at the very least ask them to retrofit the electrical systems where you can do an emergency plug-in and, and then enter into a pre-event, hurricane event, storm event, a bid process and have a relationship with some rental company somewhere where if you got 12 schools or 25 like Craven, you, you have these generators you can get in here 
and uh, keep them having schools down for two or three weeks. Anything else on this one? Yes, sir. Okay, we're ready to go to item number seven. Thank you, Mayor. Item number seven is uh, consideration of the board to adopt a resolution to initiate the upset bid process for 1620 National Avenue. Uh, in July of 2016, after being vacated by our Parks and Recreation's administrative staff, the board declared the city's property at 1620 National Avenue to, to be surplus property. Um, at that time, they established a minimum reserve bid of $85,000. Uh, the property has since received substantial damage as a result of Hurricane Florence, and we have received an insurance payout that's anticipated in the amount of $65,833 is what we're expecting. Uh, uh, Freddie Mercer. Uh, a gentleman has, uh, a local gentleman has submitted an offer of $15,000 to purchase the property in its current condition as is. Uh, there have been no repairs done to the building uh, to date. Um, and uh, if this resolution is approved, the offer will be duly advertised as required by the state statute. If no upset bids are received and the property is sold for $15,000, the city will receive approximately $80,000. $833 from the proceeds of the sale and the insurance funds combined. Uh, so it's pretty close to that $85,000 minimum bid that we established uh, some time back. Somebody could potentially upset the bid, and, correct, and, and then yep. it could even be more. And it, it, like I said, it's an upset bid process, so if someone wanted to come in and, and, and put in a $20,000 bid, they could do so as long as they put down the, the, the uh, deposit. The only way we could sweeten the pot for on the city side is if we put this in the redevelopment commission where we could have some um, say so about any conditions, but under this bid process, we cannot make any conditions to the upset bid process. And I don't think this is in the, the, the redevelopment. Yeah, yeah it's not in that area. You're right. Um, uh, Mark, does that building yeah. still have the the generator? You know if the, the generators? Uh, I don't think that it does. I'm, it does. I'm, not, sure, I'm not sure that it ever did. It, it oh, yeah. does. It's it still does. there. I don't is know it, if it's off the board. Yeah, it may be offline, sure. but I don't think it. Is that something that we can that we can move somewhere else. I, we'd have to look at it and see. I, no. I'm not sure. When we listed the property originally, um, Electric had told us it was not worth moving. Okay. It's so old. Okay. I know it's old. Cause yeah. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion that we adopt the resolution to initiate the upset bid process for 1620 National Avenue. Second. second. Yeah, motion, second. Any discussion? I would like to mention on this, I, I'll tell you, um, I, I really hate to, to even start this process and sell it at that price, but it, between what the offer is or what the potential upset would ever be and what the proceeds, that's as much as you'll ever get for the property. But at the same time, uh, I think the city knew not to set an example that, you know, that building's been sitting vacant for what, how many years now? Probably two. And, you know, I, I, I don't think city ought to, have properties just sitting around right, vacant like that. And, yes, uh, I certainly hope that this person will expeditiously restore that building back to its former days of the condition. Um, any other any other comments? Um, on let's see now this one it's a resolution. So let's have a roll call starting with Alderman Bingle. Alderman Bingle? Yes. Alderwoman Harris? Yes. Alderman Astor? Yes. Mayor Outlaw? Yes. Alderman Kinsey. Yes. Motion carries. Item number eight. Thank you, Mayor. Item number eight is consideration by the board to adopt a resolution approving the contract with James L. Caton Utilities Incorporated of Newburn, North Carolina for infrastructure improvements. Uh, we have some aging water and sewer infrastructure that needs to be replaced on Johnson Street between Craven and East Front Streets and King Street between Craven Street and Edgerton Drive. Uh, once this infrastructure is replaced, streets will be resurfaced. Improvements will eliminate deteriorated mains and service lines, increase the reliability of domestic water supply, and reduce the potential for sewer backups, uh, and improve drainage in the project, uh, project area. Uh, bids for this project were sought and obtained. Um, after reviewing the bids, James L. Caton was the lowest bid at $635,320. It is requested the contract be awarded, uh, and there's a memo in your packet from Mr. Hughes, our city engineer, if you have any questions. Board have any questions? No, nope. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to adopt the resolution approving a contract with James L. Caton Utilities Inc. of New Bern for infrastructure improvements. Second. Motion and second. Any discussion? I would like to mention, just like with our other streets that you've been working on, Metcalf and, and New, at, at any other time, if there's any other retro. 
bidding of any type of uh, infrastructure while you got that street. Now, are you going to totally like at Metcalf Street take the, the asphalt up, or or is it going to be milled? Are you milling? I'll let Jordan come up and comment on that. Uh, Mayor, on, on both of these streets, we have a combination of water, sewer, and storm drain rehabilitation replacement work. The combination of all three. Um, on the narrower sections, you're probably going to remove all the pavement and repave where we can patch and mill and resurface. We'll, we'll do that. Okay. So it'll be a combination. Okay. Any other questions? Let's have a roll call starting with Alderman McKenzie. Yes. Mayor Outlaw? Yes. Alderman Astor? Yes. Alderwoman Harris? Yes. Alderman Dinkle? Yes. Okay, motion carries item number nine. Thank you, Mayor Adams. Uh, number nine is consideration by the board to adopt an ordinance amendment to Division Two Police Civil Service Board of Article 4 of Chapter 2 of the Code of Ordinances. Um, the city's charter, as you, some of you may remember, was amended in 2016, at which time changes were made in part to the section regarding the Police Civil Service Board. It has since been discovered that uh, the ordinance addressing the Police Civil Service Board was not amended to reflect the charter changes. Uh, so some, some small modifications were necessary just to bring our code into compliance. By adopting this ordinance, the charter and the code of ordinances will be consistent with one another. I have a question. So, um, Scott, maybe you can explain to me. So we petitioned, we had to petition Raleigh to change our charter for this, and we did that? Is that what, because it's saying a charter was changed. So. Yes, ma'am. We, we had a charter that had a police civil service board section to it. Correct. And we had a code section in our ordinances that also had a police civil service board section that added a few administrative items to it. And when I, when I, draft, when I redrafted the police civil service board, we made some subtle changes to the charter and we never went back and changed the code. So now we're just simply saying in the code, look at the charter as to how the police civil service board works so we don't have any potential for incongruous rules in either one. But we really, we, we did change the premise of it because it used to function in one way. It now it functions a, in a different way. No, ma'am, it, 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 it used to do two things. Now it does one, so you are okay. right. It, it is an appeal board for police officers Correct. facing termination or suspensions. It used, it used, it used to, to also higher. serve as a recruiting and assessment, a pre-assessment board. And, and that was incredibly duplicative and created problems and it cost us three to six months of hiring. And during that three to six months process, officers would just go to a neighboring city and get a job. So we got rid of that piece. But that doesn't have anything to do with the code amendment that we're doing now. We just had some in the code. We just had some some administrative issues that the board shall meet on Thursdays and, and minor things that we just need to get rid of so that it mirrors the charter. Okay. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to adopt an ordinance amendment in Division II, uh, Police Civil Service Board of Article 4 of Chapter 2 of the Code of Ordinance. A second. We have a motion and second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, let's have a roll call starting with Alderman Dingle. Alderman Dingle? Yes. Alderwoman Harris? Yes. Alderman Astor? Yes. Mayor Outlaw? Yes. Alderman Kinsey? Yes. Alderman Best? I did read this when I get received the agenda, so I do know what's going on here somewhat. <laughs> so I am going to vote yes. <laughs> Motion carries. Let's uh, start appointments with Alderman Bass. None. Alderman Kinsey. None, sir. Alderman Astor. None. Alderman Harris. None. Alderman Dingle. None. Uh, attorney's report. Nothing to report tonight, Mayor. City manager's report. I have nothing else to report. Um, let me back up to the attorney's report just a second. We had had asked you a couple, you know, last meeting if you could look into any reconciliation of the minutes situation and do you have anything tonight or is, is this a good time to uh, any alternative ideas where we can all 
Yes, yeah, so I, I don't. You asked me to consider whether there was uh, software, um, specifically Dragon, naturally speaking, that, that might allow us to, to use technology to capture your voices and transcribe it automatically. And it turns out the software is not quite there yet. It can only recognize one voice. Hmm. So um, folks who use it, what, what they might do is take the audio from this meeting and the clerk could put on a headset and then she could just repeat or parrot everything that everybody says and that would save her typing, but she still has to sit for several hours and talk into the microphone to get Dragon to capture all of those voices. So I'm not sure that's at this point it's going to be um, an optimal solution. I know that we had just talked a little bit about a vault system uh, mm -hmm. for archiving, and I know that Alderman Astor had a, had a concern that if the present system of, our, of putting these things, archiving them, that if they, for any reason, got lost or whatever, damaged, or they, that, you know, if we went with a vault company, we would have that backup. So I had, you know, looked into a little bit of that and I was thinking of maybe within City Hall somewhere having a kiosk location where any public member, any citizen that wanted to come in and peruse it, if you put in uh, cemetery 1964 or anything along that lines, it would it would go to it. And we discussed that. Can you can you talk about that just a moment? Well, I I, I can speak to the backup technology. It, it is my understanding that it's not very expensive to have both on-site backup and cloud backup. So now we have two, two storage sources that have, have the digital version of this meaning archived. Um, as to the, the, the point of service terminal to search that, I, I don't know the answer to, to what that might cost. I, I do know that cities have similar things for their actual minutes, but I don't know if they have that to actually scroll back through a live meeting. My understanding is you can there is technology that can search keywords in a digital moving video and then go find that place in the meeting. So that when someone says billboard, you can go back to the meeting and hit minute 14.02 and find the billboard discussion. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm very comfortable with the way we're doing things right now. If it's too much on the city clerk, then I, I did ask for the job description. I haven't gotten that yet, but then we need to decide that you know, the city clerk should be a full-time job and then take a, you know, separate the jobs and let the assistant to the city manager or whatever. Uh, you know, she's been bombarded. She's too busy during the day because people are bombarding her with questions and other things. Then maybe we can separate those duties out. But I like that the minutes are the way they are. I can read them and understand them and know who said what and who was in favor and who wasn't in favor. And I want to keep... I, I, would like to keep it that way. It doesn't have to. Yeah, I just kind of want, I want to get kind of update uh, sure. from, from the attorney on that. So, any anybody else have any comments about that or anything? I, I just want to ask a question. So, our IT department, there's not some type of software that can be used to step in and take the place of what she is actually <coughs> typing. <coughs> Right. Um, but there, there, there is dictation is software, but right. what, what the mayor was imagining is that there would be software that could take this meeting okay. right. and transcribe seven different voices. And the, the research that I did did not prove up that technology. It, and the software will recognize one master voice, but it can't tell, it can't tell which of you is talking to know that Ottoman Astor said this when Ottoman Bengal said that. So with the dictation software, that's not so, is that something that's really costly? Is that something that the city has never used or well, it's, it's, have it, tried? And yeah, the, the, the basic question is, there's an easy answer and a hard answer. The easy answer is, what's the clerk job? The exactly. answer is to keep the minutes. Right. That's, that's easy. The easy. hard part is, what do you mean by minutes? Mm -hmm. The law is also easy. The law says the minutes must reflect the issues discussed and the actions taken and the yeas and nays. That can be very brief or it can be very robust and that's a board decision as to what flavor you want in capturing those minutes. 
I would probably caution you against a transcription yeah. because we'll need to build a new building to hold those minutes. Right. I agree. Okay. <clears throat> Okay. Uh, let's see. Anything else, Mr. Stevens, on city manager's report? No, sir. Let's go to new business, starting with all the legal. Um, just a couple things. Um, Mr. Attorney, um, I want to uh, come back to the noise ordinance again. Yes, ma'am. Uh, We're continuing to, you know, look at it, massage it. We said when we first put it in place back in May, we were going to try some things. Um, and... I, I would like to see if we could move forward with looking at an overall noise ordinance for the whole city and then take the pros and cons for what we're learning downtown and try to put it in there. There's been some talk that maybe we should go to the decibel. I think the decibel uh, rating or the decibel system doing it, measuring the noise by that level is going to hurt the businesses in downtown. Um, but then again, you know, the residents, we've got competing ordinances now that everybody wants to bring to the table. So I'd like to potentially direct or give some direction to start working on something that come, come back to us in a month or so so that we could um, look at making a few change, tweaking a few things, at least downtown. But if you're going to work on it, you might as well. We need one citywide because we're having issues in other places. Yes, ma'am. I, I appreciate the segue to that. Um, every five, six years, we, we have a noise issue, um, and, it, and, it's, and it's roamed around Newburn. We've had industrial noise issues 10 years ago. We've had residential and commercial noise issues. Uh, the more, more recent one is downtown. And, you know, the advice I always give is that there's two flavors to solve a noise problem. There's the, the, the more traditional old school noise ordinances, which is what we currently have. And that kind of just goes on the simple, can I hear it from a certain distance? And if so, it's too loud. At the other extreme, we have a more technical decibel system where we have decibel meters and, and measurements and calibrations to do. Um, cities split on which they like, that there are pros and cons to both versions. But, but I have advised various boards for, for 25 years that the day was going to come, probably during my career, where we went from the more traditional to the more technical and this may be that moment. So I'm happy to bring to you um, a more uh, technical approach to solving the pro to addressing the issue. It's not going to solve a problem, but to address the issue citywide. And then we can look at what we've got, look at a different approach, talk about the pros and cons, and then decide if, it, if this is the moment to, to try something different. And when you look at other cities throughout our state, that's yes, comparable to us, that what their Norris ordinance are yes, like. If, if they have decibel and have technical, we, they have. We always okay. do that, yes, ma'am. All right. That's all I have, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> I know what you're proud of me. Um, I'm jet lagged. <laughs> I have a few things. I just wanted to point out that um, it was the town and state workshop and dinner. So you guys went to the morning part, but there was workshops in the afternoon that I attended. Um, and I took notes and I emailed them to everybody on the board for your pleasure to read. Um, the second thing is I wanted to know if there was an update on Stanley White and where we're at with that in regards to consultant and... What I can tell you is that we did receive the RFPs in last week. Uh, several of uh, management staff did evaluate the, those RFPs and so now uh, purchasing has been in the negotiation process with the vendor, so that's where we stand there. As soon as the contract is signed, they'll come in and start performing that evaluation. Okay, and what about Kidsville? I see a sign out there. Have that's right. Have you gotten any donations? We have been getting donations. Staff has been going out uh, to a variety of businesses uh, soliciting for that as well. And we're working with our vendor right now to schedule uh, our basically design meeting with uh, kids in the community. So we're looking at the middle of March for that to take place. And then we should really start seeing some things kick, kick off. We anticipate the bill to be by the middle of June, right when school ends. And that way the project's done right at summertime. So that's our time frame for that. That's good. That's, that's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Thanks for uh, attending this workshop, so. Oh, I, I do have one more thing. Okay. Happy birthday to my husband. <laughs> okay. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, thank you, Ms. Mayor. Um, Mr. Stevens, I've sent you an email received today from the Homeowners Association and Hardy Farms 
as you can see, they're wanting, requesting some additional stop signs. Whatever the process is, would you work on that and let me know something, please? Okay. And I also, um, I'm not sure who would have the best update, but I'd like to know what's the status of the Doubletree and the Convention Center. So the Convention Center is um, work in progress right now. They're um, solving the issue of the uh, settling of the foundation. So that, con that RFP has gone out for a contractor to come and do that. Um, they feel pretty confident that they'll have everything done by September. They're looking by the time MS Bike is in New Bern, <coughs> September to, to be open again. Um, that's the good news. The bad news is that the Double Tree right now we're being told is down until at least January of 2020. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, that's all we know. That's all they're telling us is that they're in litigation over insurance settlements for the property, and so um, they're doing it. It's very concerning to me um, as the chair of the the TDA. Um, Mark is also a member of that board, and it is very concerning to us. Um, How many rooms is that? Yeah. 170 rooms. For both the end yes, and? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So it really puts a hurting on us. It certainly does. Um, and we are, um, I promise you, I am on it. <laughs> Great. I'm sure you are. <laughs> Thank you. And then one more thing, briefly, Mr. City Manager, would you give us an update on the Airport Road project? I know there's some drawings that are complete now. Yes. Um, so we have drawings that are probably 95, 98 percent complete. It's just basically finalizing. Uh, we're uh, so, so now we have a very good idea of um, uh, the exact design, locations of the ditches, and whatever width of, of cross sections we have. Uh, so at this point, um, uh, our intent is to have some, some community meetings uh, with uh, uh, the communities that will be impacted along those areas, probably Taberna, Bryce's Crossing, uh, uh, me for Evans, Mill. Evans Mill, uh, Hardy, Farm. you know, Hardy Farms, probably Carolina Colors, and, and, and find some venue where we could probably hit one of those or maybe two meetings uh, to where we can give them an update on that project um, and, and the design. Um, at that time, there's probably going to be uh, some, some necessary construction and permanent easements. Uh, we'll have to go uh, about doing those to, to get some of that work done. Um, and obviously, we want the input uh, uh, from, from uh, the, the folks out there in the community, but um, uh, I think we're pretty close uh, as far as the design work. Uh, keep in mind that um, this, this budget uh, that we have for this project was strictly for the design work, so it's yet to be budgeted as far as the construction works, that's something that we'll have to come back before the board. Uh, but we should have a, a fairly strong idea of what that cost is going to be. And then obviously we have some, some costs as well associated with whether or not we want to go uh, a little bit above and beyond, uh, and we talked about resiliency earlier, uh, with regards to an overhead underground conversion of some of the electric systems down through there. So uh, with some of the discussions we've had during uh, our our special meeting we had uh, to discuss electric. Um, obviously, you know Charlie's intent uh, and potential, uh, potentially locating a, a substation out that way. So obviously, uh, some some high feed lines coming out of that area and keeping them underground may be uh, of, of benefit to us. But uh, that's uh, obviously comes with a cost. Uh, I think it was about a five or six hundred thousand dollar difference in cost uh, uh, to, to go from overhead to underground on the conversion of that. But obviously we need, if we're going to do that, we should do it prior to us making the decision or, uh, on, on building this road or doing it at the same time uh, so that we don't come in tearing out some of the work that we've already done. Yeah. So we're real close, but from Taberna um, Circle to uh, Waterscape, is that correct? Yes. That's the engineered part of it that we have. Landscape. What, what, oh, either, what, yeah, whatever. The road is just past Creekside. That's correct. Land, is it landscape maybe? Right. And then who, how are we going to handle, is there going to be any drawings or anything that we can show um, Evans Mill residents from, from there on into Evans Mill? Or is that going to be designed by city workers? I think they're staying within the width boundaries. I'm not sure that we had uh, uh, specific plans drafted for that section, but uh, obviously we, we, can, we can put together a cross section 
a cross section tells a lot of word, uh, you know, tells tells a lot of the story, uh, and and shows what that width's going to be. You could show where the fog lines are going to be, which are the white lines, and then you know the center lines and stuff like that. But ultimately, it's going to be, uh, you know, a two lane road, um, and and have extra width on the shoulder side, um, uh, past the fog lines where you have the ability to to walk or bi or bike along the road at that time. So. Uh, that's kind of the intent of the design at this point. Okay. Thank you very much. Yep. Okay. The Black History Parade has been rained out twice, <laughs> and the committee would like to, to, the new dates would be May 25th and then a rain date of June 1st. If the board so would like to, if that meets with the chief and um, those, if, if we need to, Chief, those are the dates, May 25th and June 1st, that the committee want me to throw out there. So if you need to, would we'll, we'll put that, that on the agenda for y'all to formally approve? Yeah. I think as, as okay. part of the process, so, we can do that. However, that will, okay. So we'll we'll do that yeah. maybe two weeks from now. Um, can you hold off on that because I want to get in contact with Victor Taylor. We have something coming up where we wanted to be able to do that, and someone's trying to reach out to him. Mm -hmm. So can I just have? Okay. Him? Sure. Sure. And I'll just bring it back to you to let you know what he decides. But we're trying to get it on the Saturday of the Juneteenth week uh, oh, I think, okay. to be part yeah. of that week-long event that we're doing. And so I'll just report okay. back to you guys. Yeah. That'd be great. If you guys could check that out and make sure those dates work. And then maybe we'll approve that next meeting. Yeah, I'll have to give you enough that. time? Yes. That's all we do, Ben. It's all McKenzie? No, not tonight. It's all one desk. Um, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you to the group um, peddling for Parkinson and the city of New Bern for coming to the aid of Harbor Drive. They went over there and they have cleaned up that ditch where all of the debris was still remaining from Hurricane Florence. And I have had some calls from some of the residents over there and they're thank they want to thank the city and that group as well. And also I had another gentleman, um, a Mr. Force. He lives over on Hazel Avenue and there's been some problems with speeders in that area and we have, the city have, have installed um, stop signs, but he's requesting that uh, possibly another stop sign would be put in place over by Opal Street, so maybe that would stop the speeders from coming through with two stop signs on that street because it, it uh, there's a lot of children over there and they're out playing and, and, it, and it's an area, it's, it's really bad because that street runs on down to the intersection there by Hazel and Hazel Avenue and Washington Street and it's it, it's a problem it's always been a problem but um if i know mr Mac, uh, montaigne is um not here but if that's something that mark you might want to take a look at i don't know what records what statistics you may have recorded for speeders you the police department or but i just want to bring it to your attention if you could possibly I will, uh, when, when Matt returns, what I can do is just have him present this to the board okay. uh, as a whole. Uh, we've met with Mr. Forbes on multiple occasions and um, uh, actually received direction from the board to put in a stop sign at one of those locations. We have uh, pre-implementation and post-implementation stats and um, the, the post-implementation stats actually look pretty good, but I think it's probably wise for him to, to to, to, to uh, present it to y'all. Ultimately, it's the board's decision of whether you want to put more stop, stop signs, but um, I, I'm not sure that the data would be able to support it at this point. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other new business? Do we need a closed session tonight? No, sir. Is there any other business to come forward and do the Board of Aldermen at this time? I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. second. Motion and second. All in favor of motion say aye. 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 All opposed say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.